Well, hello everyone, my name is Jean-Claude Bergman and I'm a professor of open science policy at the Free University of Brussels. And before that, I was responsible for open access and open data and open science policies at DG RTD of the European Commission. I welcome you all at uh, this edition of the Frontiers Policy Lab, which is uh, offering a new platform for dialogue between policymakers uh, and scientists, in particular in view of what we have learned uh, or not learned uh, from the COVID-19 crisis, the pandemic, the way the science system reacted, the way policy reacted, the way politics reacted. What are the lessons learned there? What can we do to improve uh, the relationship between science and policy in the future? What can we do to improve policy? What can we do to improve uh, science? And therefore, it's my really big pleasure to talk and to introduce you, Professor Helga Novotny who is uh, Professor Emerita of Social Studies of Science at ETH Zurich, but of course, who is also very well known as one of the uh, past presidents of the European uh, Research Council. And she has a long standing relationship with European science and research policy, not only via the ERC, but in other, um, in other uh, groups and expert groups and, and God knows how many things you chaired <laughs> in, 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 in the past. It's with great uh, interest that I look forward to this conversation with Jean-Claude because as we all realize, uh, the world before the COVID-19 pandemic and afterwards is not the same anymore. And this has, of course, deep implications also for research. Research was at the forefront and for at least a little while, everyone was very much listening to what science had to say because this was the source of information. It was um, something that uh, came uh, unexpected to most people, although epidemiologists had been warning and telling us there will be more pandemics coming, but uh, most uh, of the world was taken by surprise by it. And so science uh, and research is very much at the forefront, but so is the relationship between science and politics and politicians. And we have seen that national leaders respond very differently in their relationship uh, to science. My impression from reading at least and trying as you to follow the science policy debates is that um, in, in the future, more and more um, po policy and, politi and, and politicians will put the, 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 the heavy weight of budgets of science on advanced and uh, on applied research, uh, uh, to put it bluntly. So the, the, the voices we heard now is that uh, we don't need, well, I'm making an exaggeration there, but, but everything mm -hmm. that has happened in science the last couple of months demonstrates the, the triumph of applied research. So why do we still need uh, fundamental blue sky frontier research or to put it uh, in, 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 in something which is close to your heart? Why do we still need an ERC uh, in, in the future? I think the pandemic also has some lessons to offer. And one of the lessons that we are learning very quickly is <clears throat> the neglect that arises when you focus too much on only one aim. And most crucial is, of course, what is the underlying problem, that we still have this unfortunate divide. You know, this is fundamental research, blue sky research, researchers do whatever they, you know, want to do. And there are the, the relevant social problems that need to be looked at right now. And this is an unfortunate divide which does not correspond at all to what actually happens. You know, I, I like to uh, say you have to explore before you can exploit. And we have to explore <clears throat> the knowledge before we can start to <clears throat> apply or exploit it. And exploration, <clears throat> sometimes it happens um, all of a sudden. We have the breakthroughs. We have serendipity in basic research. Something comes up that uh, nobody was actually looking for, but people realize, wow, this is an important finding. And you have to make space and create the conditions for this kind of exploration to take place.
this is a long haul we know that we have we also know until we get towards innovation it takes 10 years 15 years sometimes 20 years but without the very beginning the exploration nothing will happen the pipeline will dry out very quickly In the, the corona crisis demonstrated us that there are basically two components of the problem and one is the medical problem and we have mobilized massively on that but then there is the non-medical problem and part of the solution which is the economy which is the social relations which is digital for which we have actually hardly uh, or not in the same scale uh, mobilized the scientific knowledge and capabilities which we have um, I mean, for my own country, there is simply a, it's a black hole uh, what the future of the economy will look like. It's a black hole mm -hmm. to understand the long term, mid to long term effects on social relations, on psychology and so on. So the, the, the second part of the, of, of the conversation I would like to, to concentrate on with you is <coughs> the role of social sciences in all this, uh, not only today, but in anticipation. In, in collaboration, in interdisciplinarity. Um, my fear is that, 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 well, I have two observations. First of all, where we, where was this community prepared enough uh, for this kind of uh, big, big, uh, big, big challenge? And secondly, how can we optimize the cross fertilization between the, the biomedical and the social science community to be better, to come up with smarter answers? Because uh, a biomedical response to the crisis is you shut down everything and you stay at home and the problem is solved. But that is unfortunately not a social solution. No, you, are, you are absolutely right. Uh, according to my observations, the social science uh, community has responded very quickly. But it has responded with limited means and limited reach when it comes to including the social sciences in a systematic way in modeling. This was rarely the case. You had occasionally an expert, uh, you know, included in an expert force. But as we discovered, and this is another lesson learned uh, from, <clears throat> from, the, from the pandemic, the best modeling with the most sophisticated modeling techniques is useless if people change behavior. And people did change behavior in unexpected ways. And some of these changes could have been predicted by the social senses. I think what uh, would be needed and what, again, we have to rethink is how to better include the social sciences um, with the kind of modeling exercises that we have. I mean, <clears throat> look, uh, <clears throat> it's really about getting a much more holistic point of view and a holistic approach. Exactly. And if one, one of the lessons uh, of, of the pandemic, in my view, is indeed that it has uh, proven something that cognitively we may have known, but we, we don't act uh, in, in accordance, how much things are related. And we still tend to separate, you know, this is the domain of biologists, this is the domain of the mathematicians, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And yet we need to move towards a more holistic, inclusive way, um, how we look at the world and, you know, also the kind of instruments we, we employ in order to understand better what is happening. And the natural world and the social world are intertwined. This we see in climate change. You know, climate change is <clears throat> the results of human interventions into the way how we treat the environment and how we, um, you know, squander the, re the natural resources we have. And, um, you know, the virus, it's, it's, it's a tiny fragment uh, of uh, very little DNA, and it's able to disrupt the whole world. So, you know, things are very much intertwined and related. And this has to be taken up. This is my view, one of the greatest challenges.
this is probably the paradigm shift of research for this century, yeah? uh, if, if you think about it. But I cannot say if we don't start now, when? Yeah, if we don't, yeah, there's no better moment than now. So how can we do that, uh, Helga? I mean, it was not foreseen to discuss this, but how can we do that? <laughs> well, yeah. Look, uh, it always starts with um, <clears throat> an idea that uh, people um, begin to share and more and more people start to realize that this is necessary. Now, um, of course, I, I strongly believe um, new ideas coming to people are the, are the trigger, are the, the seed of uh, further development and of change. But then, of course, it needs institutional structures. And this is where, um, you know, funding comes in, where existing institutions come in. But here I can only repeat what I, what I said before. Um, we need to come up also with new um, innovative organizational models. The institutions we have <clears throat> are old institutions that have <clears throat> responded <coughs> to needs and to questions of the previous century. And now we have new questions and new challenges. And one of them is really start to look at things hanging together. Start with a more holistic approach. And this means also come up with a model, with a governance model as well, with an institutional structure that takes into account <coughs> you know, the networks that exist, the last six months clearly have demonstrated that science and science is works global, thinks global, and if need be, works together global without any problem. At the same time, the reaction from politics has been almost the opposite. National reflections, national priorities, uh, vaccine nationalism and so forth. So we have on the one hand what we have been discussing, uh, the need to come up with a new global rethinking of how we work and at the same time we have this political dynamic which seems to pull us in a completely different way which is completely counterproductive for what we want to reach scientifically speaking. So don't you see that also as, an emer as, as a huge topic of concern and, and, and uh, of the future? Well, the vaccine nationalism is regrettable and it's a regression. On the other hand, I am rather optimistic as far as the scientific community is concerned because, you know, the cooperation has been so quick and so good in terms of sharing. Of course, open science, open access has paved way for this. So, you know, people did not even have to think about it. Should I do this now? But <clears throat> it sort of was a spontaneous uh, reaction. And you had people sharing uh, sequences uh, very early on, etc. And this still continues. So I think in the long term, the scientific community will prevail. But in the more immediate term, there can be a lot of damage uh, done to it. The scientific community has always seen itself as, as international, as we know, even in the worst periods of the Cold War, you know, you had <clears throat> exchanges and among scientists. So this is a deep, deeply ingrained in the scientific community. We carry on and we need each other. What is for you the single most important lesson drawn from what we have seen happening in science and science policy the last seven, seven eight months uh, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? So the single most important lesson, positive or negative? It has taught us that we are not as much in control as we thought. And uh, this means uh, that a small unknown virus has been able to push us further into a massive wave of digitalization. Uh, the outcome of which <clears throat> is unfolding now, but we are nowhere to see where it will actually lead us. And it's through our response, the digitalization is going to be accelerated. 
You can see this <clears throat> from the shift of <clears throat> uh, office work to homework. You can see schools, universities have to rethink you know, even their, their purpose. If we rely now on digital means of uh, educating, uh, is the university still a place that should teach only 18 to 23 year olds? Or is the content that is available also something that needs to be distributed much more widely in society? And, and similar questions. Now, <clears throat> what does this mean for policy making? Uh, being not in control as much as we thought. Uh, <clears throat> means for policy making that we have to rethink the relationship between health and well-being, between the <clears throat> way how we treat the health system with the economic fallout, and <clears throat> this kind of um, you know intertwinement, the, the relationship, this more holistic approach. I think this is the most important lesson that we have to draw from what we saw there. Imagine you could fix one thing of what has happened uh, in the past, which wasn't good enough or which created a lot of problems. <clears throat> and then, so what would you, what would you fix that, uh, that, so that we can, we can mitigate much better the, the, the problem which we have listed in the past or that we can enhance science much better for the future? I think we have to learn how better to cope with uncertainty. And uh, in my book, The Cunning of Uncertainty, you know, I go as far as saying we need to embrace uncertainty. Uh, we have to learn to live with it. <clears throat> and uh, the, the pandemic is the best example. And it will be with us. And the consequences will be with us for some time, making the life of many people really <clears throat> uncomfortable unless you learn how to live with uncertainty, how to embrace it. And here science comes in, and this is a very important point for me because I have seen it in my ESC years. You know, scientists thrive at the cusp of uncertainty. They want to move on to what is not known as yet. Uh, it's this, uh, what is not as yet known, which is the most fascinating part of their work. At the same time, science tries to gain more certainty. You want to consolidate knowledge, you want to convey certainty, but you know that every bit of knowledge is always certain only temporarily, because it will be overcome by new knowledge, by better understanding, um, and so on. So um, this is something that science needs to convey to the public and also to politicians. And the politicians and the public, they crave for certainty. You know, we are hung up on a number. Uh, how many uh, cases have gone up or another index number without understanding the context. And here I come to the, to the future and speaking about digitalization or dataification as it's also called, the future will be much more data driven than our present. And unless we begin to understand and to care and cure, curate the data that we will have to rely upon and that we will rely upon in the future, you know, we may be pushed into four certainties you know, a number can be very reassuring and it can be completely wrong because it's taken out of context. And we have to convey to the public, you know, uncertainty does not mean don't know anything. Uncertainty is something to be navigated. Uh, and you have to learn, you know, is this like our ancestors, you know, crossing oceans in small tiny boats, uh, settling in, I don't know, uh, the Fiji Islands or, or wherever, you know. They, they learned how to read the waves and how far could land be by looking at waves. And something of this is, is necessary um, to, to uh, get public to appreciate also. Thanks a lot, uh, Helga, for sharing your insights uh, based on decades of participation, observation and management yourself. And uh, looking forward to, um, to create these uh, new ideas which we have been, uh, which have been launching. Uh, thanks a lot and good okay. luck.
It was a pleasure. Thank you for a very nice conversation. Thank, Thank you. you.